Welcome all and thanks for stopping by. I'm going to be going over some hand plane sharpening basics that I'm hoping will bring some sharpening mystery out of the clouds and into focus. The number one rule is that it's hard to remove a lot of steel. Here are the soles of a couple planes. Like everyone else, I spent some time flattening them on sandpaper. Now realize the body of these planes is made of cast iron, which is much softer than hardened steel. In modern abrasives, they're harder than either of those. But like most people, you give up after getting pretty close because it just takes too long to get all the way. This area here, I never really got all the way to flattening. To get deeper here, you got to flatten this whole area here. And that's just a lot of cast iron. Now when sharpening, you have to remove hard steel with precision. That's what makes sharpening a little more than a rudimentary skill. The more steel you have to remove, the more difficult it is. So think about it the other way. It's easier to remove less steel intelligently to achieve a cutting edge. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, let's talk briefly about abrasives. And let's start talking about stones. So stones can be hard or soft. You can get oil stones or water stones. They can be small, they can be large. Uh, the prices can vary a lot. You know, the cheap stones are basically a piece of rock and not very expensive. And the more pricey ones are man-made and they're made of different materials. You have to keep the grit unclogged so that uh, the stone, the grit on it stays sharp and you have to flatten them periodically. Now, I'm not going to recommend, you know, one stone over another. There are different camps that promote the different stones for their virtues and it's really up to you. I find that stones, if they're fine, are good for honing, and a, uh, a coarse stone would be good for moderate material removal. Personally, I have a fine grit whetstone that I use to polish the edge of my irons. Then there are wheels, which are really just uh, stones of a different shape. In my opinion, wheels vary from aggressive to very aggressive. They can be wet or dry. They can be not so expensive to very expensive. Diamond wheels, which are kind of in another category, but they are very expensive. If you have a wheel and you plan on using it, then get a guide for it. Now, if you can freehand and achieve a 25 degree grind, then you don't need to be watching this video. But for the rest of us mere mortals, you will need a guide for it. Grinders are very good for heavy material removal, meaning you have to redefine the bevel angle or you have to grind away a blemish. I have this cheap coarse stone that I use for just what I said, redefining an edge. And I also have this fairly pricey uh, whetstone that I use uh, to actually put on an edge but uh, it's not as perfect as uh, flattening it on a plate. One caution that I have to tell you is don't expect a machine to be a substitute for skill. If you have this machine, you still are going to have to learn how to sharpen. Then there's sandpaper, which I personally think is the best option for somebody starting out. Get uh, wet dry sandpaper and uh, lubricate it with water. It's very inexpensive, but you do need a flat surface to mount it on. I use a, a mirror and I don't use any adhesive, I just use the water and the surface tension from the water holds it to the mirror. Uh, sandpaper is cheap, it's disposable when it gets dull, and uh, finer grits are fine for honing and uh, the coarser grits are good for moderate material removal. Because sandpaper is also large and comes in very large pieces, it's a good candidate for flattening, you know, as opposed to a stone. And I use many grits for the full range of sharpening. And at the top of the abrasive pyramid is the diamond. Most people lubricate them. I use water on mine, but I don't think they have to be. They come in all different shapes and sizes, and for what they are, they tend to be expensive. The larger ones tend to be quite expensive. The good news is they're very durable. At finer grits, they're very good for honing, and at coarser grits, they're very good for heavy material removal. I have this one here, which is fairly fine grit. And I use this to dress my water stone, and I have also used it occasionally to redefine an edge. Finally, an honorable mention would go to strops. Uh, they're typically made of leather or MDF or something that can be loaded with a polishing compound. And using a polishing compound, they're used to put a final polish on an edge. I have a belt on my belt sander here that's made of leather, and I don't typically use it on my plane blades, but I do use it on knife blades. Now let's take a couple minutes to talk about angles because this is important. 25 degrees is thought to be the best compromise between blade performance and durability. So think of this piece of PVC as kind of the cross section of a plain iron, obviously very large, and that's a 25 degree angle. 
Here I have a diagram of two extremes. This would be a cross section of a plain iron here with a very shallow angle, maybe six or eight degrees. It's more like a, a knife edge. And down here you have the opposite. You have an angle of about 60 degrees, which is, you know, more like an axe or a cold chisel. So the beauty of a blade that's really thin like this one is just imagine how easily it would slice through the wood fibers without really distorting them very much. It would take very little effort to plow this through. The bad news is it would dull easy, and if you were to hit something hard, like maybe a knot, just think of how it would really cream this fine edge. And if you had to repair this edge, you'd have to rehome this entire face here, grind away all this material to define a new point. Now on the other extreme, if you have a very high angle, it's more like a snow plow. So imagine how hard it would be to push this through a piece of wood and peel off a shaving. However, the edge retention would be great, and if you were to hit something hard, like I say, like a nail or something, this edge would deal with it far better than this one. For a couple thousand years, woodworkers have fiddled with different steels and materials for the irons, uh, sharpening angles, and planing angles. Today's hardened steels like 1090, 1095, 02 seem to work best when they're sharpened around 25 degrees and held at angles at around 45 degrees. These are more like guidelines than actual rules. So here's a block plane and a bench plane, and you can see here that the iron on the block plane is at a lower angle than the iron on the bench plane. And what's curious is that the cutting angle for both of these planes is the same. Simple diagram I have to show you the two planes. So this is a block plane represented by this guy. And the frog on a block plane is at 20 degrees. The iron is sharpened to 25 degrees, but it's a bevel up. So the actual angle that the plane meets the wood is 45 degrees from the sole of the plane. Now contrast that to a bench plane. And the frog itself is 45 degrees, and it's the same 25 degree grind on the iron, but the iron on a bench plane is beveled down. So again, the angle that the iron meets the wood compared to the sole is 45 degrees. So what gives? Well, a block plane is made to be held in one hand. Hold and control the plane with your fingers while applying pressure with your palm. The low angle frog gives you the kind of geometry to realize this form factor. A bench plane, in contrast, is meant for two-hand operations, so the tall frog doesn't interfere with the full-size handle. Now, there are low-angle block planes that have the frog angle of 10 or 15 degrees. They are out there. And here's a bit of a teaser question. This tiny plane, is it bevel up or bevel down? Well, if you look at it, you can see that the frog's holding the iron at 45 degrees. So this is a bevel down plane, like a bench plane. So let's talk about where the rubber meets the road, which is the very edge of your iron. This is what's doing the cutting. I'm going to use this piece of plywood to act as a stone to illustrate. So the simple technique is to hold your plane iron at the perfect 20 degree angle and rub back and forth, climbing to higher and higher grits, finer and finer polishing, until you've worn away this entire face right up to the very, very edge and you've formed perfect razor's edge. And just realize that sharp enough to shave hair doesn't mean you'd want to shave your face with it. It's not too difficult to do this, but there's an easier way. Here I have another set of diagrams to illustrate. So you hone this down to your 25 degrees, and once you get it close, and I've got this little blow-up area here at the very tip, you put a micro bevel on it. So you lift the plane a little bit higher, and you hone it, and what that does is it shaves a little bit of the very, very tip of the tip. And this is a very small area. You're not removing a lot of steel. It's very quick, even at fine grits. So in this diagram, I'm showing the secondary bevel to be at about 2 degrees. You're lifting this to 27 instead of 25. Uh, it doesn't even have to be that big. And then there are some camps where you put a tertiary bevel on it. You lift it even higher to 30 degrees, and you've honed that edge even more. And then you can even put a back bevel on it, which is you flip the iron over, and you hone this edge. And I don't know if you can see, but we're talking about a very small amount of material. The very, very tip of my blade here is shinier than the rest of the bevel. Well, that's all I have for now. I like to keep my videos short, and hopefully, if you've made it this far, you have a better understanding of the what's and why's of sharpening. On my next video, I'll show how I sharpen, which I think is simple enough for anyone to master. In no time at all, you'll be able to put an edge on a chisel, plain iron, or a knife. Thanks again.